Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out tonight. It's great to see people in person. Um, it's hard to get back into that swing of coming to things in person, though. It's so much easier to do this in your pajamas behind, shut your video off, and you can listen away. But we're glad to have everybody in person because this is just so important. I'm Mary Ellen Duggan. I'm the district nurse leader and wellness coordinator. And I'd like to welcome you to our three-part series, Raising Resilient Kids, What to Do When You Don't Know What to Do. And we've all been there. So Carrie Toole is our presenter, and I'm so excited to have her here with us this evening. Carrie and Dr. Jennifer Lipton O'Connor joined our medical advisory team last spring as we began to switch our focus from COVID to a broader scope of encompassing the physical, mental, social, and emotional well-being of our students, staff, and community. Carrie is the executive director of Castlebrook Counseling Services and is an independently licensed clinical social worker who specializes in dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT for short, with adolescents and adults. Carrie also has a subspecialty treating individuals in the transgender and LGBTQ plus community. She graduated with her master's degree in social work from Columbia University and for many years worked in residential programs for adolescents. She is a highly empathetic, validating, and energetic person and provides supportive, solution-oriented therapy with the focus on assisting individuals and families to develop new ways of thinking about problems and the choices that they can make to resolve or cope with them. She has clinical expertise in treating depression, anxiety, self-harmful behaviors, suicidality, borderline personality disorder, mood disorders, recovery from trauma and abuse, difficult family dynamics, as well as a multitude of other emotional, behavioral, and social issues. She is passionate about providing evidence-based treatment to assist her clients in developing positive coping strategies and building a healthy lifestyle. As many of you know, every two years, the students in grades 6 to 12 participate in a Metro West Adolescent Health Survey, which gives us, as a district, data on various health and risk trends, as well as protective factors that are for our students. When we received our data in the spring, the rising trends in mental health risks were notable. In response, we hosted parent webinars in the spring to address some of these rising trends in stress, depressive symptoms, and suicidality. We have had various staff professional development in the areas of mental health first aid, and we'll be implementing the Signs of Suicide program in the middle and high schools in the upcoming months. A student mental health club was recently formed at the high school and events are being planned for our students as we speak. Last year, under the guidance of Dr. Lipton O'Connor, the district also conducted our first universal social emotional learning screening. The data from this initiative was very informative and demonstrated that some of the areas our students are struggling in include emotional regulation, self-awareness and self-management. We know that these are important skills for our students to have to work on from a developmental perspective and that students need these skills in order to be able to learn and be successful at school and in life. We also know that partnering with families and engaging our communities is critical in this work of supporting our students. And this three-part series is part of that collaboration. Before I hand the mic over to our esteemed speaker, Carrie, I would be remiss if I didn't thank the Southboro Health Department for making this evening possible for us all. Thank you to the health director, Dr. Heather Alker, who's here with us this evening, and the assistant director and public health nurse, Taylor West, for supporting this endeavor. On with the show. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for coming out. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I've been wanting to um, present to parents uh, for so long, and I've done some things through Southboro Youth and Family Services, some other towns, um, because the, the kids are struggling, they're suffering. Pre-pandemic, we were in a really not so great spot, and then the pandemic really blew that out of the water. So, um, And then there just aren't enough therapists for kids and teens to go around. And there are so many things that, you know, I work with the, the parents of my clients to teach, okay, here's kind of some, you know, first aid kind of stuff that people can do at home 
to hopefully keep kids out of the therapist's office. That's the ideal for me, right? So um, dialectical behavior therapy is my passion. It is uh, built for suicidal and self-harming individuals. And it is something that can be really, um, you know, uh, generalized to a lot of us and especially to kids. And because their brains are really growing at a rapid pace, different parts are growing at different times and things go a little haywire at certain points. So um, these skills and techniques and, and concepts can be kind of blended everywhere. So um, some of the things that I talk about with parents are some of those skills, how to really um, build resilience in our kids. And resilience is not protecting them from falling down, right? And kind of building this framework around them to, to uh, protect them in different ways. Resilience is about building the ability to get back up after a failure, after a challenge, after something doesn't work according to plan, right? And kids get really kind of um, overwhelmed by that idea right now. So um, how to build some resiliency in our kids, what parents can do, and, um, and I'll kind of just talk about the three different um, workshops we're gonna have. So today we're gonna talk about the emotional superpower of our kids, right? A lot of the kids that come into our services and a lot of the kids that we're just seeing, you know, navigating the world right now have an emotional superpower that they don't know they have and if you've ever watched a superhero movie right what happens when the superhero first gets their superpower right it's mass destruction because they don't know how to harness it right and that's what's happening with our kids especially as they get older and developmentally we're going to talk about this tonight different things are kicking in right? They don't know how to manage those parts of their brains yet. So we're going to talk about that. So they have a superpower that they don't know how to harness. And if we can kind of reframe what's going on with their emotions in that context, it helps us as parents to see it in a different lens, see it through uh, in a different light. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. I, I'll give you some hints and pointers and different techniques to try, you know, so you'll have tools and techniques as of today. Um, next week, we're going to talk about that there's no such thing as a bad feeling, right? So a lot of my clients come in, a lot of our families come in, and they talk about, oh, I, I am feeling so bad, or they had this bad thought, right? And then we're learning to judge our own experiences, right? There's something wrong with us if this is bad, therefore there must be something else that's good, right? So I'm gonna teach different techniques as parents that we can use with our kids to help reframe that concept that there is no such thing as a bad thought. We don't have to be ashamed of our thoughts. There's no such thing as a bad feeling. Feelings are there to tell us things, right? So how can we kind of, um, uh, I'll have a bunch of different concepts and metaphors and ideas that you can share with your kids to kind of help them reframe the way that they're thinking about their own inner experience, right? So that's going to be a lot of fun. And then the third one is about the magical skill of validation. This is the number one skill I teach any parent that I work with. Right? This is the number one skill. If I'm out and about you know, just meeting people and they're like, hey, what do you do? And I'm like, hey, I'm a therapist. I work with suicidal and self-harming teens. And they're like, oh my God, let me tell you about my stuff. And the one thing that I definitely, no matter what's going on in that conversation, I talk so much about validation because it's a game changer. Right? It's a game changer for how do we get our kids unstuck to move forward, but we can't move them forward until we let them sit where they're at, right? So that's gonna be a good time too. I think, I have a lot of fun. So, all right. Now, show of hands, just out of curiosity, who's got elementary age kids? Yeah, middle school. Oh yeah, buckle up. I'm, with, I'm right there with you. I got an eighth grader and a sixth grader, so I'm feeling it. Thank goodness I was a therapist before I was a parent. Holy cow. It's, it's exciting times, right? And high schoolers? Yeah, and beyond? Yes, all right. It doesn't stop, does it? <laughs> Just in a different context. <laughs> nice, awesome, okay. All right, so the things that we're gonna talk about tonight are, you know, 
for all ages. And we're, I'm going to highlight some stuff that's happening developmentally in those middle school years. If you look statistically in terms of depression, self-harming, suicidal ideation, those things tend to really begin in middle school. Makes sense. They're hitting puberty, right? Seventh grade, there's something, I almost said magical, not so magical, about seventh grade where things just really kind of ramp up, right, developmentally. So... So we're going to talk about what's going on with these kids. We're absolutely in a mental health crisis. If you talk to a therapist who's been working with kids and families for many years, this is not new information, right? We were in a mental health crisis before the pandemic, right? Trying to get a therapist that works with kids and teens and families, really hard to do in those after school hours already. And then with the pandemic, it actually helped in a couple ways that, you know, with telehealth and kids doing, you know, Zoom school, right? They were able to get more access to therapists for a while there. So that was fantastic um, in ways. And now we're kind of back to, um, you know, the after school hours. And telehealth is still the thing. So we're able to access kids for therapy, even if their parents aren't home to drive them. So that's kind of cool. So, Metro West Adolescent Health Survey data. So this is for our middle schoolers. So here's grades seven and eight, and these two things are grades six, seven, and eight. Okay, so these were some of the questions that they, they, they were asked. So some of the things that really jumped out for a lot of us, um, and those of us in the field were like, yep, that tracks. Um, Life is very stressful in the past 30 days. Almost 20% of kids um, agreed with that. Um, depressive symptoms, 21.1%. 17% kids self-injured in the past 12 months. That's a big jump, right? In 2018, it was 9.1. It's almost doubled, right? So there's, there's some stuff going on. Right, considered suicide in their lifetime, jumped from 13.5 up to 19.8. So one in five kids in our district, this is our district, one in five kids from sixth, seventh grade up has considered suicide in the past year, right? 6.5 attempted suicide, right? Now an attempt, they weren't really specific about what an attempt might have meant. It might. It probably wasn't only if it met, required cert, um, medical attention, right? There are sometimes kids who, you know, um, might engage in a behavior thinking it could result in them dying, right? And they would consider that an attempt. I would consider that an attempt, right? As a therapist, so that's a big jump as well. So things we got to look at. Um, in terms of the gender, and my understanding is that the questions we're not asking about non-binary kids. So female or male were the only options, is my understanding. This number in the female identifying kids, big, big jump, big jump. So when I was being trained as a therapist and doing risk assessments, right, uh, someone comes in, they're having suicidal ideation, there are a bunch of questions that we ask, and one of those, you know, things that we look at to assess risk, one of the risks used to be male versus female, and the male were the higher risk. That's not the case anymore. Things have switched, right? We're looking at grades six, seven, and eight, self-injury. One in five kids is self-injured in the past 12 months. A quarter of our kids have considered suicide in their lifetime and almost 10% have attempted. These are scary numbers, right? Again, this is six, seven, eight, my bad. Grade six, seven, eight, right? So also grade six, seven, eight in terms of the grades, right? So eighth grade, these numbers really jumped up. And so this is considering things like in the past 12 months, so it would go like seventh grade into eighth grade, because I forget what time of year this was implemented. 
March, so the spring. Yeah, can't recall. It was a while. It's all a blur. Right, we missed a year. In the fall, okay. All right, so this would be, so for the eighth graders, it would really be talking about their seventh grade year, right? So that tracks, right? So this is for the middle school. For the high school, this is Algonquin. Um, there were, I just wanted to point out the questions about suicide changed from lifetime to the past 12 months. So we're not even collecting information on lifetime um, suicidal ideation or attempts, right? So this is just in the past year for kids. And here we go with this data, right? So again, the 2021 data, big jumps depressive symptoms in the past 12 months, over a quarter of our kids in high school. Almost 21% have self-injured in the past month, 12 months. Almost 20% have considered suicide in the past 12 months. And 5.2 have attempted. And again, like these numbers are very worrisome about female identifying kids. Life is 50% basically, say life is very stressful in the past 30 days. Depressive symptoms, 35.6%. Self-injury, 27.8% of female identifying kids have self-injured in the past 12 months. Almost a quarter have considered suicide and nearly 7% have attempted, right? So these are our kids, yes. Um, so the for depressive symptoms, yes. Figuring it out for themselves, right. So the question is, um, for the questions about depression, are they kind of listed out as particular symptoms or are the kids kind of left to their own devices about figuring out what, this, what depression means? And Mary Ellen's gonna work on that and get back to you. So, <laughs> so feel free to interrupt me when, when we get that, but very good question, yes. All right, so any questions about some of the data so far? Yes. How many kids participated in the survey? So we've got those numbers here. For the middle schoolers, nope, that's not the right one. For the middle schoolers, it was 609 in 2021, right? So we've got the breakout, female identifying, male identifying, and then grade, so. But what does that compare to the actual population? Probably not. It was not mandatory, no. So there, I'm sure there were some kids that self-selected out and families that self-selected out, right. right. I was just wondering, out of the entire school, yep. what are these based on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, great question. I don't know the school um, uh, attendance and all that, so. Nine hundred students total. Yeah, for the middle schoolers, and then high school is about twelve hundred. Okay, so that looks like there were about two hundred kids that didn't report. So could those numbers be different? Absolutely, right? And still, that's still some scary numbers, right? Yep, yep. So. With this information in mind, looking at the Metro West region, so this survey um, covers you know, a bunch of communities in the Metro West area. The good news, 88% of youth report they have at least one supportive adult in their lives. That's good news that they feel connected, right? 35% of middle schoolers and 43% of high schoolers who endorsed those depressive symptoms did report that they were seeing a therapist. Those are also good numbers. Right, and that Massachusetts is number one in the in the country for access to mental health care. Kind of scary if you think about it, that we're number one for access, right? So the not so great news, you know, based on the people taking the the survey, right? Thirty percent of the middle schoolers and forty two percent of the high school rulers are reporting high anxiety. Female identifying kids are twice as likely to report depression, self-harm, suicidal ideation, suicide attempts. Kids with physical and or learning disabilities 
um, twice as likely to experience mental health symptoms, right? LGBTQ plus middle school youth are three times more likely than heterosexual cisgendered youth to report depressive symptoms and ever over four times more likely to report self-harm, suicidal ideation, suicide attempts. Huge need. And then LGBTQ plus high schoolers are twice as likely than heterosexual cisgendered youth to report depressive symptoms and over three times more likely to report self-harm, suicide ideation, and suicide attempts. Also part of the not so great news is there just aren't enough child and adolescent therapists to go around to meet the need, right? So this is part of, you know, a lot of the warning signs about what's going on with kids and mental health right now. So what's, what are some of the things going on in our kids' lives that is kind of exacerbating this besides, uh, you know, the pandemic and all the things with it? So there are a number of different things that I like to um, highlight to parents when their kids are at different ages and the things that we can do in those moments, in those stages. So if you remember high school biology, was this taught in middle school? I don't know. Nature versus nurture, right? There are some factors that are biological that are creating more um, emotional vulnerabilities in our kids at different stages in their lives, right? And depending on DNA, et cetera. And then there are some things that are environmental, right? So we can't so much, you know, control the biological. We have a lot of influence over the social, right? So how can we, even little changes that we can make tonight, right, creates change in people's neurology, right? Have people heard of neuroplasticity, right? The things that we do every single moment changes the way our brains are networking, right? So things that we can ha do now are gonna create change down the line, especially if we're consistent for it, with it. So DNA I talked about a little bit, right? What are we kind of gifted with from our genetic makeup, right? It's, Look kind of further back in your own family histories, right? If you've got a lot of stuff is genetic, right? A, a lot of the things that we see, anxiety disorders, depressive disorders, there's someone in the family tree or some aspects in the family tree that kind of, you know, it comes from somewhere, right? So um, I tell a lot of the clients that I'm working with when we're talking about family history, I kind of look over at my client, the teen, and I'm like, you won the genetic jackpot, didn't you? Right? Whew, awesome. Here we are. Right? <laughs> so um, what I love to talk about with families is especially the part of the brain called the amygdala. So this part of the brain is our fight or flight mechanism right? It can, it's the thing that assesses for threats. And most of the time, if we're going about our day, do, 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 right? That's not really front and center for a lot of us, right? For a lot of people who are built with more highly sensitive brains, right? And this is where the superpower comes from. They're born with this oftentimes, right? When they have more sensitive brains, that it is inherited in their amygdalas, that fight or flight response and that scanning for threat. And it's not just a physical threat, it can be an emotional threat, it can be a threat about status, it can be a threat about I'm being left out, right? A lot of those threats, so the amygdala in people who have high sensitivity to emotion, i.e. pretty much every middle schooler and high schooler right now, right, is smaller and more densely packed. So it's like a firecracker. It's like a stick of dynamite, right? It takes next to nothing to set that puppy off, right? And because it's so sensitive and ready, just kind of looking for any sort of thing to, you know, really pop off about, right? It's on constant high alert. It's constantly scanning, right? And then it just gets reinforced and reinforced, right? So the teens amygdalas, Right, so sometimes, you know, we would think that an amygdala would light up when there's a really obvious threat, right? Somebody's got a, you know, a really angry face or something like that. What science has discovered is, and I went, I saw this at the conference we just went to a couple months ago, 
is that they took researchers, I forget where they're from, I'll find my source, um, they took adolescents with high sensitivity to emotion, put them in a functional MRI so we could see what happens to their brains, and showed them some different types of faces. So they showed them a neutral face with no expression. They showed them a face with like 50% expression, and the expression was like, um, I think, fear. And then they showed them with like a big, like 100% expression. The kids' amygdalas, their fight or flight, lit up with the neutral faces. And I talked about this in some of my groups this week, and they were like, oh yeah, oh I freak out when I can't read someone's expression, right? Because I don't know what to expect. I don't know what they think. I can't read them. And they get so scared and overwhelmed, they don't know what to do, right? So in working with our kids, in dealing with our kids, right, to be able to show a bit more expression can help reduce the reactivity of their amygdalas, right? So it's okay to be really expressive. I know sometimes we get overwhelmed, right? Sometimes I will shut down when I'm stressed out with my kids and I'll just like kind of do that like RBF face, right? But at least they can read that, right? <laughs> so that's, that's better than just being really super neutral, right? So it's okay to be expressive with our kids. Right, because their their brains light up more, their danger brain part of their brains light up more when they can't read what's going on, right? And so the benefit to having a smaller, more densely packed amygdala is we feel all the things, right? So I put myself in this bucket of having the superpower of high emotional sensitivity, right? Anybody else relate to this? Feeling more than other people do? right? Being told sometimes, like, you're being too dramatic, or why aren't you over this by now, right? We get that from the world, and that's, and it hurts, right? Because then we start to think there's something wrong with us, right? Our brains are built differently. And guess what? If you raise your hand, good chance that somebody else in your family has that DNA strand too, right? The high sensitivity is something that's genetic very often, Right? So we feel all the things. And it's wonderful when you know how to harness it because you can experience joy, you can experience sadness. And when you embrace those things, life can be pretty awesome, e even with the highs and the lows. Right? A lot of time the world tells us that we're too much. We're feeling too much. You need to stop it. Right? So not knowing that you have a superpower and not knowing how to harness it yet is where a lot of these things stem from. They try to shut it down, they try to squelch it, right? And if you have a superpower, you've seen in the superhero movies, like when it, they let it rip, when they don't know how to harness it, mass destruction, right? And that is sometimes my household where somebody who doesn't know how to harness their superpower yet, it, right? The house is on blast, right? So it's not something that is a problem, right? When I have clients in my office and I reframe their high sensitivity to emotion as a superpower that not everybody has, they're like, oh, oh, that's kind of cool, right? And I'm like, yes, you can use this to your benefit, right? You can read a room. You know what's going on with your friends. You know when mom and dad are upset or when your parents kind of like in a good mood and you, that's when you sneak in the request, right? is something you use to your benefit. Fantastic, it's a skill, it's a superpower. Not everybody has this, right? Not everybody can feel to the level that we feel. When I realized this, and I tell this with all my clients, when I realized that I feel at a greater level than most people, it was like a game changer for me. I'm like, oh, so just because I thought that they were that they should know how I felt because I know how they feel. It's like, oh, it doesn't work that way, right? They actually can't feel what I'm feeling. It's something that's unique to me and some of my high empathy people, right? So anyone who's an empath, right? Your kids are empaths. They feel all the feelings. They come back from school and they're like, oh my gosh, this thing happened with my friend and I'm so, you know, upset about what happened with my friend, right? They're the empaths. They're the ones with the superpower, 
right? So to teach them how to get into their superpower and feel it is the way to harness it. And that's when we talk in three weeks, we're going to talk about the validation. That's how to harness your superpower. All right. I could talk about this all day. So the cool thing about this, well, sometimes the cool thing about the superpower is that it's not just in terms of emotional sensitivity. It's systemic, right? So at uh, the conference I went to, they talked about how people who, you know, the, the, the folks with really big high emotional sensitivity superpower often can develop a diagnosis called borderline personality disorder. And they did some research about some physical effects that align with that diagnosis sometimes. And we see a lot of inflammatory disorders with people who have high emotional sensitivity, right? So, you know, I've been working with high emotional sensitivity kids and adults for 20 plus years. I can tell you there's a higher rate of migraines and headaches. There's a higher rate of belly issues, belly sensitivities, right? Skin sensitivities, sound sensitivities, food sensitivities, right? Um, inflammatory conditions, right? So the sensitivity isn't just in their emotions. It's head to toe, right? And once they realize that this is just how I'm built, it takes a lot of the shame and blame away, right? So they also have folks with this high sensitivity superpower. There's also a higher reactivity, right? So also adolescence, <laughs> right? There should be a whole separate diagnosis code for puberty and up, right? So higher reactivity, they react bigger because it is bigger to them, right? So if you see your kid and they're flipping out and you're like, what happened, right? Something happened in their experience and they're reacting to it. So I tell a lot of my clients, you are built like a Ferrari, you're a finely tuned machine. It takes next to nothing to get you flying, right? So we got to take care of that and really, you know, protect that about you, right? And the brains aren't self-regulating yet, okay? Frontal lobes aren't made or fully developed until about 25, 26 years old. So they're works in progress. Their brain's under construction, right? Just because sometimes they're bigger than us doesn't mean that everything's online yet. It's definitely not, <laughs> right? Okay, and then slower return to baseline is a thing when you have this emotional superpower. Things are like really big, right? Some, one of the expressions we use, one of the metaphors we use is that trying to navigate the world with a high sensitivity to emotion, right? Having this emotional superpower is like trying to navigate the world with an, a third degree burn right? Something that somebody else is able to just kind of like bounce off of and be like, oh, there's, there's a chair there. Oh, do do do. Going on with my day, right? Would be excruciating, an excruciating experience to someone who has high emotional sensitivity and reactivity, right? So sometimes we might look at our kids and we're like, why are you so upset? It's not that big a deal, right? Just chill out, like it's not, you know, it's fine, it'll be fine, right? And for them, it is a big deal. They're feeling lots of feelings and they're big and they don't know what to do with them, right? So just being aware that, especially during adolescence, right? Middle school, high school and up, there's a, their brains are on fire. Their brains are on fire in terms of their emotions. And it takes them longer to come down, right? So, you know, I used to think this about myself because I'm Irish and we hold grudges, right? <laughs> it's a family trait. But it's actually, you know, I have a higher sensitivity to emotions. So it feels so big and it takes me so much longer to kind of get back down to what we call baseline, right? You know, I'm married to an engineer love my engineer husband, his emotional reactivity is kind of like, do, 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 we're going along, something happens, blip, <laughs> right? And I'm like, I can't do that, how do you do that? And he's like, meh, doesn't bother me. Meanwhile, my head's exploding, right? I go along, something happens, boop, and pfft, like I'm, you know, across the room and I'm gonna be there for a long time, 
right? So being able to say to our kids, okay, you're still feeling what you're feeling, right? And to be aware that even though if something happens and we're ready to talk about it, they might not be, right? So to give them kind of the um, agency to check in with them and say, like, hey, where are you at? You know, I love, to, I love numbers. I'm a data nerd, right? So where to scale things, zero to 10, where are you at in terms of how big your emotions are right now, right? If, and where do you think you, we need to be? This is a great conversation to have before the argument, right? Highly recommend that, right? If, where, where's a good point? at which it's okay to kind of have, we can still be in the conversation without it blowing up, right? And if you're above that number, we're gonna wait. We're gonna do a distraction, we're gonna do a different skill, we're gonna you know, take a break, we might even sleep on it and talk about it tomorrow. That's okay, give it time, right? Let their brains come down, yes. So what happens when the child doesn't, wants to talk and you know it's not the child? When the child wants, yes. Yes, they're, you're like, please stop, please stop. You're not ready to talk about this yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So, so validation is really key, right? To be able to, and we'll talk about this in a couple weeks, right? To be able to say, I see how upset you are about this. You are so upset. Totally makes sense. And when we're this, and the royal we, Fabulous technique, okay? The royal we allows them to feel connected with you that you've got them, right? We, there's no way we can talk about this right now when the emotions are here. And I really want to do this right with you, right? So let's do something else. Let's distract. And again, wonderful conversation to have before the situation, right? And to talk with them and say like, hey, here's a, here's a bell curve of what happens when we're in emotional distress, when we're at the peak of that curve, not a good time to be problem solving or figuring stuff out because we're impulsive. Our amygdalas are on fire. We are not thinking things through. Our frontal lobes are nowhere to be found for ourselves too, right? There are times when, when my emotions are off the chart and I don't do a very effective parenting technique, right? <laughs> and then, you know, I come down later and I'm like, dang it. Ugh missed opportunity on my part, right? And so I go back to my kid and I say, you know what? I screwed that up. That was not the way I wanted to handle that situation. Let me tell you what I really wanted to do, right? And then we'll talk about it. So the more open we can be, especially when the kids have the high sensitivity, we're gonna give them more information. They're gonna feel more secure. They're gonna feel like they know more about what's happening in the situation, right? So. Talk about it. Family dinners. Hey, what are your emotions today? <laughs> right? So, which is hilarious because, again, I, I'm Irish. I grew up in an Irish family. We don't talk about feelings in my family. Right? How funny I became a therapist. <laughs> right? So it is, to I totally get that awkwardness, that fear of what if I open up something and I can't put it back together? What if... Um, my kids tell me something and I don't know how to respond, right? Am I gonna make it worse, right? We have that fear, of course we have that fear, right? So, and the most effect, just go there, go there, right? Because it shows them that you are okay just hearing them. You don't have to have any magic words to tell them anything that's gonna make them feel better, because we're not, right? We'll talk about that in the validation stage, right? All right. So we have a superpower. We have kids with superpowers. Yeah, who knew? And oftentimes, kids with the emotional superpower, adults with the emotional superpower, we're drawn to things like becoming a therapist, right? The arts, theater, music, design, baking, architecture, right? Those really things that um, are about emotions, right? So we can use it to our benefit in the long run. It's who we are. All right. So prefrontal cortex, brain development during adolescence. This is why I love working with adolescents, right? Because the world is, everything's possible, 
right? Everything's still being built, right? There are, it's this amazing opportunity, and they're old enough that you can, like, reason with them, right? And they're young enough that everything's still malleable, right? So we can take these opportunities when kids are first getting, like, the amygdala is on fire. The hippocampus is on fire. Things are coming online that were not online before, right? And it's kind of like when they were little, little, right? And you put them to bed, and then you, they woke up the next day, and they could do five new things. And you're like, where did that come from? Literally an overnight switch, right? Same thing's happening during puberty. And it's happening in here, not you know physical necessarily. Right? So we may not see it quite so well, that things are really getting kicked into high gear in terms of what emotions they're experiencing. Emotions get bigger, they get deeper, they get more painful during adolescence because literally different parts of the brain are switching on. Right? And they don't know how to harness them yet. And do you remember what happened? Oh, yeah, rapid brain, brain growth. So other than infancy, right, where their brains were growing at the substantial rates, right? And how much did they sleep when they were infants? Like 18 hours a day, remember those days? Never when you wanted to sleep, right? And then adolescence is the second highest rate of brain growth in development. So no wonder what they need to sleep all the time, right? And the melatonin releases, I was on the start time later task force, so I'm all about this, I have been for a long time, right? We're fighting biology. Right? Their brains start releasing melatonin closer to midnight. There's a circadian rhythm shift. Right? Doesn't matter what time they go to bed. Their brains are not releasing melatonin. Right? Have you ever tried to? I mean, we could probably go to sleep at like 2 o'clock in the afternoon, depending on what's going on. Right? But for adolescents, their brains aren't letting them. Right? And they need to sleep. The average adolescent brain needs to sleep nine and a quarter hours every night. Right? How much sleep are they actually getting? probably a third less, right? What if we tried to function on a third less sleep every single night, right? And then they have to memorize facts and the War of 1812 and you know, deal with complex social stuff and th their brains are on fire, literally. Lack of sleep causes inflammation in the brain, right? So we're, th it's kind of a setup. It's kind of a setup, right? Pruning is something that happens during the different stages of development where we start pulling the, the brain is a very efficient organ, right? When the, when the stage for something to develop is over, the brain starts pruning back things that are no longer useful, right? So the brain is kind of like use it or lose it, people, right? And in different stages, when, once we've developed language, Right? My husband's a perfect example of this. So he and his family came to this country when he was four or five. Right? And his family members, his aunts came when they were 17 and 19. Right? All came at the same time. So my husband doesn't have an accent at all because his brain was still developing the language parts of the brain. Right? So he was able to really switch over to English without an accent at all, right, where his aunts still do because that part of the language acquisition and development part had already pruned back for them, right? So brains are cool. They're very, very efficient. And sometimes the adolescent brain over prunes regulation skills because they're sleep deprived, they're inflamed, there's a lot of stress, right? It's, it's messing with the brain's natural ability to regulate itself. So sometimes there's over pruning that happens, right? So like I said before, the prefrontal cortex is not built till age 26. So when they go to college, or if they go to college, when they're that young adult phase, they're still gonna do pretty interesting things. They're not gonna think it through. Prefrontal cortex is the part of our brain that is the youngest in terms of development, right? So a friend of mine um, uses the metaphor of you know, that classic New England house that was built in 1800-something, and then they needed more space, so they built on, 
like an, another couple rooms and then they built on after that like it looks small from here but once you go around the corner it's like you know another 400 feet of house right the brain was built this way too right there's that's why there's all these different sections that do different things right you don't just like you know start over like demolish it and start from the ground up it's being built on more and more and more so the frontal lobe prefrontal cortex is the youngest part of the brain to evolve this is our reasoning this is our decision making this is our ability to step back and analyze and say hmm what would happen if i did that thing right we have it we might look at our kids and say why did you do that didn't you know that this would happen they didn't know that this would happen right that part of their brain is not online yet right these two parts of the brain the amygdala here's your fight or flight right here's your learning in the hippocampus learning and memory how nice that they're neighbors not so much right because you know fear-based learning stress learning right and then the prefrontal cortex is way far away right so part of adolescence is building the networking between that prefrontal cortex and the other centers of the brain to help regulate it slow it down right during you know um, those early school years elementary school years middle school years high school years it's all gas and no brakes. Their brains just don't have it yet. So we can be their prefrontal cortex for a while to help them build it up, right? So it's, it creates this greater risk taking, which is necessary to really take those risks to leave the nest, right? Or to go try a new adventure, right? Go off into finding a new work environment, right? Those are really risky, scary things that you know, if there was t too much um, inhibition, they'd really struggle to do, right? So they need this biological risk-taking ability, right, to not have the prefrontal cortex online just yet until a little bit later. It's evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology? Yeah, that's a field now, it's super cool. All right, so remember these stages? <laughs> Right? So kids having a meltdown. She dropped a receipt we got from the gas station. Meltdown. Remember this? We were here for this. This was good times, right? He has a cereal bar in his left hand, but he wants the cereal bar in his right hand. <laughs> meltdown. Right? They can't regulate the emotions they're experiencing. They can't navigate the world to get their needs met because they're toddlers, right? We wouldn't expect it of them and it's exhausting, right? So because she had to wear shoes, this little munchkin, right? Complete and utter meltdown. Their brains weren't ready to handle it. We expected it. It's called the terrible twos for a reason. Three was not much better at my house, right? That was even worse somewhat. They had more language, that was fun. So now it looks like this. <laughs> They're just bigger. It's a new stage of meltdown, right? And we need to expect it. It's going to happen. Their brains are evolving. Things are coming online that are not regulated yet, right? So if you've got a middle schooler, Expect tears. Expect, I hate yous. It means you're doing your job right, by the way. Right? When they say I hate you, it means you're doing your job right as a parent. Right? Limits and boundaries. Yay. So the, uh, this is my favorite. She's my favorite. She's my favorite. <laughs> I want her as a client. <laughs> I get that look so often. Um, so yeah, so this is, this is going to happen. So it's just like we expected it, and we knew it was a stage when they were two, and you're like, come on, three, and then three wasn't much better, and you're like, come on, four, right? Yeah, this is going to be a few years, buckle up, right? And it's going to improve every year, ideally, if we can teach them to validate themselves. And I'm going to teach you how to do that, okay? Sympathetic nervous system, things go 
haywire sometimes, right? So now we're getting the hippocampus into the mix, prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, this is like things, whew, high reactivity, right? The sympathetic nervous system takes charge and shuts down logic. It shuts down that prefrontal cortex. Literally, when the sympathetic nervous system, that fight or flight response gets triggered, there's like a wall built between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala right there, right? So if you've ever gone in to take a test and you've got test anxiety, right? You studied, you know the material, right? You sit down to take the test, blank, nothing. It all fell out, right? When, because we're nervous, our brains don't let us access anything in here or anything in that hippocampus. No. Yeah. When, which is learning and memory, when the amygdala is in the driver's seat, right? So similar to that situation where your kid's like highly reactive is in the, in the middle of the high sensitivity outburst, right? They're like, I need to fix this now, right? Their frontal lobe is nowhere to be found in this whole conversation, right? So if you tell them, hey, your frontal lobe is not engaged, again, conversation to have when things are calm, right? Your frontal lobe is not engaged. Let's bring you down so we can bring that bad boy back online, right? And then we'll figure it out. But this is not the time to try to figure things out when things are really escalated. We're not going to make the most effective choice, right? And we can say this to them. They know their brains are growing, right? Are we having the puberty conversation with our kids when they're, even when they're young? I chase my kid around the house. I want to talk about your uterus. And she's like, ah. right? <laughs> I've been working for teenagers for 20 years. Like, I can do that conversation in my sleep. Send me your kids. I'll do it, right? So to be able to just talk to them about what's going on in their brains, just like we have the conversation, what's going on in your body, right? We can do that same conversation and say, you know what? It's going to be wild for a few years and things are growing and we're building patterns during this time. Things are under, you know, under construction and what we build is what we'll kind of maintain, right? And change can happen, but that's why I love the adolescence, because if you build it, if you build a network while things are still growing, you know, things are much more likely to be, you know, successful moving forward. So that's why I love the teens. All right, yes, brains cannot distinguish between different types of stress. Academic stress, physical danger stress, fear of being abandoned or betrayed stress, right, family stress, all lives in the same part of the brain. All gets that sympathetic nervous system on board, right? Stress is stress. And if you remember a few, few slides back, you know, how, what percent of kids identified that they, they felt very stressful in the past 30 days? Half of the kids who responded. Half of the female identifying kids that responded, right? More than, more than half total, right? So that amygdala, if there's a lot of sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight, it's going to be trained to react to all these different stimuli over the course of your day, right? There have been studies that if you have a trauma history, your amygdala is more, has more of a hair trigger. So things like, you know, something that somebody else who didn't experience that trauma um, would be able to regulate your amygdala is going to go into that pff, high reactivity very quickly, right? So there's a constant high alert, constant scan for threats. Chronic cortisol or stress hormone release damages that hippocampus learning and memory over time. It's kind of like um, how sh when we eat sugar and then the bacteria, you know, um, makes our teeth weaker, it gives us cavities kind of what happens with stress in the hippocampus, right? It's really kind of, um, it makes it less effective in regulating emotions, accessing learning, accessing memories, right? So we need to give our kids' brains opportunities to de-stress. And that's not something, you know, pandemic was like constant stress, not being able to be around their friends, constant stress. They needed that social engagement. If your kid was high sensitivity, right, and you were under stress, guess who felt it? 
They absolutely felt it. You might, you've been trying to protect them from it. They felt it anyway, right? So that's definitely a factor, right? So that's the nature side of things. Here's the nurture side of things. These things are within our ability as parents to assist kids in learning how to manage, right? Again, the brains can't distinguish between different types of stress. The constant stress response, right? If they can't get away from their stress, it creates this um, learned helplessness mentality. Like, Ugh, this is just how my life is going to be. It's miserable. I can't bear it. There's no hope. Things won't ever get better, right? And when there's stress after stress after stress and no ability to detach, disconnect. I saw something that a friend of mine posted about kids on TikTok, and I'm not on TikTok, um, talking about they're going old school now and when they go out with their friends, they're only bringing a flip phone so they can fully experience the time with their friends. Oh, <gasps> rocket science. Who knew? Who knew that you could disengage from your electronic and have a really authentic experience, right? <laughs> right? They're, they're having to rediscover this, right? So climate stress. This is really interesting to hear from the teenagers now and the, and the young adults and the younger kids even. Um, I had like a, a conversation with some of the kids in one of my groups the other night and the question that was posed was, would you, would you, it was kind of like a, you know, G-rated, would you rather, would you rather live for a year, uh, like 200 years in the future or 200 years in the past, right? And most of the times up till now, the answer was 200 years in the future. I want to see what's happening, right? Every kid was, nope, I don't want to go. The, f the world is going to be gone by then, right? Everything's going to be on fire. I would, I would much rather go 200 years past because life was easier then, direct quote, right? So they're looking at what's happening in the world right now and being like, we're done. We're toast. It's not worth it. Lots of climate stress. This is a thing. With the young adults especially, we're seeing that a lot, a lot. And increased hypervigilance with stress, right? When you're on high alert, you're going to, the brain is, um, what's that, confirmation bias is a thing in the brain, right? So when we're looking for something that's threatening, we're going to find it, right? And it trains our brains to look for more things that are threatening, right? It, if you look for it, you'll find it. Right, so we do a mindfulness when we're talking about that with emotions, where we'll have the kids scan the environment and you know look for all the things that are green in the room. So they look around, notice the things that are green, do do do, and then I say, okay, close your eyes now. Tell me all the things that were blue. They can't. I mean, they can name maybe one or two, right? But if you're looking for it, you're going to find it. And so many times with kids, they're seeing, okay, like, oh, this is going to be a rough day. This is going to be so hard. Today's going to suck. And they're like, yep, that's, that's a thing, that's a thing, that's a thing. And they're missing over the things that are enjoyable in different ways. So if we can have the conversation with them on a regular basis about like, hey, what went well today? And don't ask about happy. That's too big of an ask sometimes, right? Ask about content. Ask about what went okay, right? Because happiness is, is too much to ask for sometimes, right? A kid is not going to experience happiness every single day, especially if they're struggling with high emotional sensitivity, right? And then they think they should. Well, why aren't I happy? What's wrong with me that I'm not happy? Everybody else is happy. I see all these things about choose happy. We can't choose happy, right? Good idea. And we do have to make choices to look for the things that create more enjoyment, right? And when you're a high sensitivity person, it's not that easy, right? So we'll talk about that. And stress impacts our central nervous system, impacts our brain development with the kids, right? If they're stressed, different things are going to build differently if they're under stress, right? And it affects DNA, right? Inherited trauma. Right? And Kanto, everybody saw in Kanto, right? Generational trauma is a thing. It actually, research shows that when there's a trauma, 
that happens generations ago, the DNA changes in generations to come, right? So stress and trauma do impact how brains are built. There's trauma, right? Trauma is not always with a capital T, especially for high sensitivity kids. A lowercase t could be an invalidating environment, something that they're expecting a response and they did not get a response can be a trauma, right? If they're feeling ignored or not um, recognized in validations, even with the best of intentions, which is usually like we're doing things with the best of intentions and they're still experiencing it sometimes as an invalidation, right? And it really changes the way that the brain processes, changes all those neural connections, right? So, yep, has an impact. Social media. My eighth grader is so mad at me. I won't let her have a phone yet. <laughs> right? So it's this constant on, right? If you haven't seen The Social Dilemma, highly recommend it, right? Because the programmers of cell phones are using what our brains do as a subconscious threat, you know, scanning mechanism to benefit their product, right? So, you know, if that little blue light on my phone comes up and I see it, I'm like, ooh, somebody messaged me. And I'm going to go to it. I'm going to respond to it, right? It's creating this feedback loop in our brains where social engagement person to person isn't so much the thing that's creating more serotonin release in our brains. It's coming from those devices, right? When they get a like, when they get a retweet. Are they still on Twitter? I know they're not on Facebook, right? So when they get a social media response, that's what's starting to release their serotonin levels, right? So that's in a book called iGen by Jean Twenge. Highly recommend it too, right? How the, um, the devices in our lives are actually rewiring how our brains work, right? So that's an influence that happens. Uh, what's, the, what's the recommendation? Wait till eighth for cell phones, right? Um, my first kid's phones will be a stupid phone, not a smartphone. <laughs> Dumb phone. <laughs> I keep joking, I'm gonna get them the jitterbug, ones that they get for the old folks, right? <laughs> Big numbers on it, you can text that way. <laughs> they don't think I'm funny, right? So, and then, you know, the constant social media, there's this constant, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna miss something, I'm gonna be left out of something, I have to keep on tabs, like somebody's gonna say something and I won't have a chance to respond to it if it's about me. Right? It's this constant threat that they have to be on. They have to be monitoring at all times. Right? So it's exhausting, and their brains are still developing. So it's this flood of stress that is shaping their brains differently. Right? So leaving more opportunities for vulnerabilities for high emotions if there's a constant flood of stress hormone. And there's no downtime to self-reflect, right? When we were kids, we could get off the bus, not deal with anything social if we didn't want to, right? We had the ability to detach. That doesn't exist anymore, right? Those arguments, those social conflicts, all those things that we got to leave at school, they're following them home all day, all night, right? I've got clients that'll wake up in the middle of the night to respond to something on social media, Right? So now their sleep is getting disrupted. Right? Here we go. Right? Lots of stressful situations. So yes, it's all connected. Environmental invalidations. So this is something that as family members, we can really, really modify our responses. Right? There's only so much we can do about stress. You know, a lot of that stuff we're not in control of. There's only so much we can do about trauma experiences. There's only so much we can do about social media, right? This, we have a lot of influence over, right? So, and we gotta think though, what did we learn from our families about emotions? And, you know, what were we taught? My family, we were taught to like, shut it down, don't talk about it. Big surprise, I had depression as a teen, what? Right? So not allowed to talk about your feelings. When you have a high sensitivity superpower and then you're told that shouldn't exist, what? 
I mean, not, I wasn't told that shouldn't exist, right? And my superpower told me from my environment that they clammed up when emotions were the topic, right? I'm like, oh, this is how we're supposed to respond to this, right? So the more that we as parents and guardians can go to our kid and say, let's talk about your uterus or whatever, right? Or like, let's talk about that really uncomfortable thing that happened. Let's talk about how I screwed up as a parent and I want to do something different. We're teaching them ownership. We're teaching them it's okay to make mistakes, right? And they'll be mad and that's okay, right? I tell my kids all the time, like, yeah, you can be mad at me. I can handle it, right? My frontal lobe is fully formed, mostly, right? So, so I'm able to, when they're having an emotion, right? A lot of our natural responses as parents is to say, oh no, I need to like make you not feel that painful emotion. I need to help you not feel that, right? What a kid will hear from that is, oh, I shouldn't feel that way, right? There's something wrong because I'm being, I'm getting the message that I should not, I should get over it or I should be comforted enough to not feel it, right? So the world will say to a kid with high sensitivity to emotion, you shouldn't feel the way you're feeling. That's the negating part, even with the best of intentions, right? So my kid falls, skins her knee, and I'm going to go to her, of course, and I'm going to say, oh, no, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. You're okay, you're okay, right? I'm comforting. For my son, that'd be totally fine. He'd be like, yeah, I'm good, right? They're built differently, very differently. My mini, you know, my engineer husband, my soon-to-be engineer son, right? They're built very differently than myself and my daughter, right? So she's going to hear if I'm like, oh, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, right? To her, it's not okay. And she needs to know that it's not okay, that it's okay that she's not okay. And that's the thing that's, you know, out in social media right now, out in the world. It's okay to not be okay, right? That we don't, we don't have to try to take away the emotions that they're experiencing. It's okay to be sad, right? So it's okay to feel hurt when a friend says something hurtful to you. Let's sit in the hurt. Let's feel it, right? And as adults, we're like, yeah, I don't want to, right? Oftentimes, we got to teach the kids that it's okay to feel it. It's okay to feel what you're feeling, right? The behaviors might not be okay. We'll talk about that, right? The emotions make sense, right? Even when they don't make sense because brains, right? Their brains are on fire, right? When does the environment pay attention? This is part of the things that we do, we are doing to reinforce what's going on with our kids. Sometimes, a lot of kids with high sensitivity, the world is a very invalidating place and only pays attention to them when they lose their minds, right? That's when people come and say, what's going on? Like that's when they, you know, the, they go talk to the school adjustment counselor. They're like, okay, so this is what it takes for me to get my knees met, right? And it's creating this feedback loop, right? So if we can, as adults, be able to say, okay, I'm going to pay attention to the little stuff, right? Really tune into the little stuff and assist them in feeling their feelings and not just wait till it's a big deal to respond. If you know you have a high sensitivity kid, right? Other kids that are wired differently, you know, the data says that you only have to get it right about 30% of the time as a parent. <laughs> so it's okay. We're going to screw it up. It's awesome. We're good. We're good. You only have to get it right about 30% of the time, right? High sensitivity kids, probably a little bit higher. You want to aim a little bit higher than that, right? So be, but really pay attention to what it is that you're reinforcing. If you're only, you know, aware that you're attending to something when it becomes problematic, right? They're going to go to that level in order to get you to pay attention, right? Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, bah, 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 bah. All right. So fun things that happen when all this stuff influences each other. Increased cortisol, which we talked about. Inflammatory diseases can get triggered. Um, seeing a lot of... Um, Pandas, pans, pots, lots of that is getting diagnosed right now. Tons and tons. Um, early onset puberty, 
like kids are getting you know, into that puberty stage younger and younger and younger, that's often as a result of stress, decreased self-awareness. So they're just trying to navigate the world and they're not sure what their own values and gut are trying to tell them because they're just trying to like, especially with high sensitivity kids, they're just trying to like keep everything at bay, right? So less focus on what's going on internally. So the end result with all these fun nature and nurture things, oftentimes is what we see, this internalized narrative of there's something wrong with me. I shouldn't be feeling what I'm feeling. This is a problem. My environment is telling that me that this is a problem. We're not telling them that this is a problem, right? They're interpreting the things that we're doing to try to care for them, right? They're hearing it through a different speaker, right? When we talk next week, I'm gonna translate a lot of things, right? And what to say differently. Right? So they have this internalized narrative, there's something wrong with me, I should be able to fix it, I'm broken. Right? So when I'm kind of having this conversation with the clients coming in my office and I say those things and I'm like, kind of in your head a little bit right now, aren't I? And they're like, yeah, it's kind of creepy. Right? And then they immediately sign on the dotted line for one of the groups that I'm running. Right? So. And then they say, okay, there's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with what I'm feeling. I need to shove it down. Make it stop. I'm not supposed to feel it, so I'm going to turn it off. Right? If you have a superpower with high sensitivity to emotion, are you going to be able to turn it off? No, you're not. Right? It's not going to happen. You might keep it quiet for a little bit. You might ignore it. You might be able to numb it out and say, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Right? And it's kind of like trying to keep a tsunami at bay. Right? I'm okay. I'm okay. Right? This is where a lot of things start to, they, they start looking for ways to numb, to avoid. Substances come in. Behaviors come in. Right? And then when it's the, I can't take it anymore. I'm I'm, I need to not feel this. I need to not feel this. Ah! It comes out. Here's the tsunami right? They're overwhelmed. They're in that sympathetic nervous system, panic, right? I can't take it anymore, right? So it's, it becomes an explosive or an implosive behavior. We have tons of clients. We're seeing this so many places where school refusal, right? Because it's exhausting to go to school when your brain's on fire, right? And so different types of behaviors develop to try to self-regulate in different ways, right? And they're not always very effective, right? Because how many skills groups do we have for kids as they're younger to say, hey, here's a great way to cope with stress. It is starting. I'm loving it that it's more in the schools and more in just, you know, the, um, the environment, right? And it's still rough out there, right? So this is what happens. Yeah, this is not my image. MCU, don't sue me, right? The Incredible Hulk, right? This is the superpower that is not harnessed, right? When the Hulk goes into the Hulk, it's Hulk smash, right? Ultimate destruction. If you watch She-Hulk on Disney Plus, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Bruce Banner as the Hulk learns DBT, the treatment that I teach, right? to teach him how to regulate and integrate the two sides of himself. And that's what we can teach our kids too. You're stressed outside and you're calm side, right? How, we can integrate it. So you get to harness your superpower and use it when you want to, not have it control you. Make sense? Yeah. All right, so the behaviors that co kids are often going to develop as coping mechanisms if they're really in this like high sensitivity, trying to shut it off, this is what we're seeing in the data, right? Avoidance, risky behavior, substance abuse. There was a whole section on substance abuse that I didn't put up here, right? Um, Self-harming, because it works. You're, you get an injury, your brain releases endorphins. It's part of how we work right? It's not even a conscious choice. So when someone self-harms and creates an injury because the pain is so deep, 
right? And in the brain, physical pain and emotional pain live in the same part of the brain. Whether you broke your leg or whether you're depressed, same part of your brain is lit up, right? And endorphin release because of an injury is going to create painkillers. It works, it numbs the pain and it's instant, right? So of course kids are gonna go toward that if they don't have other skills on board yet. This is not just a thing that humans do, by the way, right? If you've ever seen those commercials for the ASPCA, Sarah McLaughlin singing in the background, right? Those commercials with the abused and neglected animals, right? They self-harm too. Animals will gnaw on their body or like lick a certain spot, you know, to create raw patches, right? They're doing that same behavior to try to self-regulate. So it's not just humans, right? It's very primal. Eating disorders attempt to self-regulate, right? Substance abuse attempts to self-regulate. Argumentativeness attempts to self-regulate to control the environment, get, with, get your needs met, right? These things are so often going to develop, right? So, and they work and they accidentally get reinforced sometimes depending on the environment, right? And we're doing the best we can, we are. So holy crap, this is a lot, right? So what can we do differently right now, tonight, with our kids, right? These are the things when parents come in and come into my groups, this is some of the top language I teach them. Right? Number one, check your own system first. You're dealing with someone with an emotional superpower. They're going to read what is going on with you. Right? So you need to bring yourself down first. Right? Get yourself out of the sympathetic nervous system in order to be more effective in helping them manage their stuff. We need to be their frontal lobes. Right? Their frontal lobes are not fully developed yet. We need to be their frontal lobes for a little bit. Right? So it reduces our impulsivity. You know, the times where I lose my mind at my kids is because I'm, you know, at peak frustration, right? And I'm not going to be a very effective person at that moment. Right? So I need to manage my own self. It also models for them the effect of coping, right? So if they, they're still watching us, even when they're older and they've left the house, they're checking with us about like, how are you handling that, right? Even if they say, oh, you don't know anything, parents, right? They're still watching. They're still observing. We're in the environment with them. So even if we're not having a direct conversation, I love to talk to myself in my house, I talk to myself all the time. I'm like, whoo, okay, I'm feeling really stressed out right now. Okay, deep breath. <sighs> okay, I'm having these worry thoughts. All right, let me see if I can like tune into my system and my kids, you know, they may or may not be paying attention, right? But I'm modeling for them the narrative about how to cope with my emotions, right? So if we can model that process that we're doing, they're watching, they're gonna learn, right? And so checking our own system helps us be more effective as well and helps us support them better in listening to what they're, they're trying to say, right? Naming their emu emotions, it's huge, right? Because if we have a high sensitivity kid who's trying to not feel what they're feeling because it's wrong is their narrative, is their interpretation, if we can help them tune into their system and say, what's going on in there? What are you actually feeling? Right? My favorite sentence, what's your system telling you? Right? What were you thinking? Don't do that one. Right? What, were your, what was your brain telling you in that moment? What thoughts popped in your head? Right? That's a, a way that's not judgy, because what were you thinking can feel a little judgy, right? So what thoughts popped in your head? What was your belly telling you? What did you feel in your body? right? All those things are fabulous ways to teach our kids, our high sensitivity kids, to tune into their own 
systems because their guts will steer them the right way for themselves. It's when they're not listening to their systems that things tend to get pretty dicey, right? And the more that you can teach them, okay, what were you feeling? And they can name something. And feeling bad is not a feeling, by the way. So bad isn't a feeling, right? Get out your phone, pick an emoji, right? Name something that's other than bad, right? Good is not an emotion either, right? So the more that we can get them to really um, granulate the emotional experiences they're having and name them, and we can say, yeah, that makes sense. It's, that's a beautiful thing to help self-regulate right there, right? So again, validation, right? And we're going to do, in two weeks, deep, deep dive into validation. I will literally have a list what to say, what not to say. <laughs> again, take it to your kid, show them the list. They'll cross out things on different things, right? It makes sense that you are feeling, if this is the only thing you get from tonight, this is the thing, okay? Validi they come to you with an emotion, Make sure it's not the emotion bad. That's not an emotion. Show me in an emoji what's the emotion, right? It makes sense that you're feeling that way. You don't need to know why. You don't need to be able to tie anything together for them. They probably don't even know. Their amygdala is just having a dance party in there. It's okay, right? It's okay that you're feeling that. It makes sense that you're feeling that. And then stop. Don't try to fix it which is so hard as parents. We want to fix it. We want to make them feel better, right? But rushing to try to fix something gives them a message that you shouldn't be feeling that, right? There's timing involved. We do want to get them to solve their problem, right? But if they're trying to do that in that high emotional state, it's going to get miswired, right? So it makes sense you're feeling this way. Let's just sit in the emotion. It's all right. You can feel that way. I'll tell my kids, you can be mad at me. You can feel sad. Let's feel sad. That sucks. That's a bummer, right? It's okay to feel that way. And to be their frontal lobe, right? So leading the witness, I love, <laughs> I call this the Columbo routine. People remember that TV show? Yeah? Well, Columbo was this bumbling detective and he played dumb a lot. And he's like, oh, I wonder why this is a thing. But he really knew what was going on, right? So I love to play dumb with my kids, right? And my clients too my friends, my husband, right? And I'll be like, okay, what's, so how, wait, hang on, I'm confused. How did you get from here to here? I missed something, right? I missed a step. Can you explain that to me a little bit more? I totally didn't get that part, right? How did you get from here to here? Where did that come in? Where'd that thought come from, right? So also being able to think, you know, their brains are still developing. They don't have that foresight. They don't have that ability to analyze a situation and look at potential outcomes and options, right? Depending, you know, it gets more wired the older they get. But for certain points, we're going to have to be their frontal lobe. So we can kind of like ask those questions about like, oh, okay, that's a really tough spot that you're in. What are your options? Right? Like, I know what I want them to do, but if I tell them what to do, they're not going to learn how to self-reflect and figure out what's right for them. Right? So if I say to them, what options do we have here? Again, the royal we, right? What options do we have? You could do this, right? And they'll come up with some, like, you know, off-the-wall thing about, like, oh, I could run away. I'm like, yeah, you could. You could run away. Just go with it. Right? It's kind of like um, improv. You don't ever want to say no, that I'm not going to do that. You say yes and, right? Yeah, you could do that. What would happen? What would be the potential outcome? What other options do we have? Let's put all the options on the table, and then you can kind of pick and see what one's going to be beneficial, right? So kind of helping them walk through the decision-making process of how to cope with some of their emotional stuff, right? Um, how to avoid communication landmines. If you've heard me talk before, you know that these are things that I say pull out of your vocabulary now, right? And I've done this since my kids were little, 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 right? Especially with the high sensitivity kids. So my son, it's fine. He can, he can hear these things. It's no big deal. My high sensitivity kids, my clients too, right? 
the minute they hear the word but, relatable, right? You're like, I know you're, it's so hard, but, and then they're like, you don't understand, right? They freak out, right? Because what is it? What is it about that word but? The word but invalidates the first statement you just said. You worked really hard on that project at work, but this little piece needed some, some you know, attention. What do you hear? You hear the criticism, right? Because the but completely invalidated that first part, right? For the high sensitivity kid, this is like a dagger to the heart. So take out the word but if you can, right? I know this is really hard and, and we can do something different and we can make better choices and we can think about things and make, you know, pause and self-reflect, right? We can do all those things. The word should, <laughs> kind of judgy, right? It's like, the, it implies that there's a right way to feel. You should be happy. My husband says that all the time. No, I don't know how you should feel. You feel how you feel, right? Take out the shoulds. No shoulding on the kids. Get it, get it, right? No shoulding, right? Because they end up shoulding on themselves. I shouldn't feel this way. Right? And now there's not just the emotion they feel, there's shame and blame on top of it too. Right? So take that word right out of your vocabulary. And no, I understands. Right? Even if you've been through the same predicament they're in, you don't understand. We can't. How can we ever fully understand somebody else's experience? Right? So we can say things like, I hear you. I hear what you're saying. Right? I see where you're coming from. I'm picking up what you're putting down. I'm smelling what you're stepping in. There's all kinds of different ways that we can show people that, we can show them that we're hearing them without saying, I understand, right? Makes sense? Because what's the first thing they say? No, you don't, right? And we don't, we don't, right? Um, also, if you can, if these words are in your vocabulary with a high sensitivity kid at home, if you have a high sensitivity kid at home, these words need to go, right? Manipulative, dramatic, and attention-seeking. I once went to a school meeting with a kid on an IEP, one of my clients, and one of the, like the chair of the special ed department or something used the word manipulative about my client. Oh, we had a conversation, right? It's that kids attempts to try to manage their environment. They're trying to get their needs met. It's not effective and it's burning bridges, and they don't know a better way, right? So they're gonna go to that behavior because it works, right? People aren't happy, but they get a need met. They're getting attention in some way, shape, or form, right? So if we can reframe the way that we're seeing their behaviors, right, when the behavior comes up, and if we can look at it like, okay, they're trying to connect, they're trying to get a need met, right? And like, ooh, I'm mad right? Or, oh, that's squidgy, right? That's the place where when I feel that, I'm like, okay, validate. Validate the emotion and draw a limit on the behavior. And I'll teach you how to do that in a couple weeks. Okay. Oh, so next week, time to wrap up. No such thing as a bad emotion, right? We're going to, I'll teach you the different techniques I use and I've learned over the years about how to um, assist our kids in navigating conversations, the world, reframe things, right? And then the, in two weeks, magical skill of validation. All right. All right. Any questions? That was a lot. How's your brain? Oh, thank you. What's that? I can answer your question about depressed, the depressive symptoms. So they ask many questions. I think there's over 200 questions that the students are asked. But, um, oh gosh, it just went off. So it starts off with um, these, they kind of clarify what the section about. It says these questions will ask about worrying and stress. And then they say, how often do you feel worried or stressed about schoolwork, about home, about things like that. And then it goes into the same things. How often have you felt sad or angry about these things? And then it goes into, um, have you not been able to sleep? Have you, you know, how many times in the past two weeks have you felt this way? So it's very descriptive each time. And they ask it different ways throughout the survey. And then 
put all that data together. Does that answer your question? Okay, you're welcome. Did anybody else have any questions for Carrie? Oh, all right, well, thank you again for coming tonight. We're so glad you're here. We will be posting a recording of this on the school website if you have any friends that you want to or if you want to watch it again for anything you might have missed and not written down. But I know I have the hardest time as a parent not to be the fixer. And I have grown, adult, they're in their 30s. I'll be doing this with my grandchildren now as they grow. But the whole thing is I understand and stopping there is not my MO. You know, I want to make it all better. <laughs> so we hope to see you again next week and the following week. And I hope you have a great night.